everyone. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, this is Summerine. Alfred. <laughs> uh, and today, uh, this is episode 142, and today mm -hmm. Adam Taylor is going to explain uh, Matrix plus Ma the Matrix Voice plus Pink project Ooh. he worked on, which is like super cool. So we're just going to go straight to Adam. <laughs> awesome. Got to learn so much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hi, Adam. Hey. Hey, how are you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm good. So hopefully today we're going to be able to explain a little bit about this project I created on on Hackster. Mm -hmm. okay. we, we're looking at how we how we got the pink voice, the, the matrix voice, actually working with the uh, the Xilinx pink board. Mm -hmm. So it's really quite simple. To, it was really quite simple to do once you uh, once you understand a little bit uh, once you understand a little bit about it. Uh -huh. uh, but obviously, there's always like like everything in life. Nothing's quite as nothing quite goes as smooth as you think it's going to do when you first start off uh, doing this. So you learn you learn as well as you go. You learn quite well as you go along as you go. Along. Um, so I guess where to start? So I guess we should really start with. I should show you what the actual project's actually doing. So I've just fired it up on my desk, and you can see here we've got the we've got the Xilinx uh, pink board. So that's a uh, special board, and we'll talk about that a in a little while. And we've also got, of course, as you'll be aware, we've got the matrix voice that's connected to the. Uh, oh, not very used to this now. Yeah, we've got we can to, see. Uh, <laughs> to the Raspberry Pi connector, uh, and you can see the LED just sort of cycling around and driving around. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we've how we've done all this and how it how it all works. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the first point really is I should I should talk a little bit about pink and explain what and explain actually what mm -hmm. pink is. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so pink is a. Uh, so Pink allows you essentially to use Python with Xilinx FPGA. It's very specifically sort of the, the heterogeneous system on a chip type. So the, so the devices that have got dual core, that have got ARM A9 processor cores in there or the A53 processor cores in there. And it allows us to run a Python framework on there and then access the programmable logic uh, just as just by making Python function calls. So it's really cool. So you get all that, you get all that. And also with it, you get all the benefits of programmable logic and all that, all the acceleration and uh, determinism that comes with using the programmable logic implementation, without actually, without yet actually having to be a uh, designer line of uh, VHDL or, or Verilog. Mm -hmm. so it's really, it's really, it's really quite powerful. It's really quite simple. Uh, and actually, what's really interesting about it is that we use to develop when we use Pink when we create our Pink application. We use Jupyter notebooks, mm -hmm. so these Jupyter notebooks are actually based, uh, are actually hosted on the host, hosted on the pink. So if you can see, if I hold it up again properly in the right right direction, you can see I've got an Ethernet cable connected to my uh, to my pink board. Yeah. If I, if I try to share my try to share my screen here, how do I do this? Uh, is there some controls on here? Yes, there are. Present. Present the window. If I present this, then hopefully we should see. We should be seeing the. You should see a sort of a Jupyter notebook page at all. Is that presenting? No. Oh, no. Um. So you can. I have to, because I have to click on the share button. That's why. Yeah. So once I click yeah. on the share button, you should be met, perhaps seeing yourself now. So, so this is the yeah. site, the kind of pink environment that we get when we first when we first start up. So you can see we have the so this is the this is the environment you'll see when we first start uh, a number of a number of folders essentially but but all this is all this is hosted and, and stored on the uh, on the pink board itself mm -hmm. uh, so for this application we've I've written a really simple um, really simple Python script hopefully you can see and I'll, I'll talk to you about this uh, in a little while I think I think I need to explain the architecture of the solution uh, mm -hmm. first before I. Uh, before I delve too much into talking about the uh, talking about the script, I'll stop. I'll stop sharing there and go back to my webcam. Hopefully, so it was really it's really quite a, it's really quite cool because that allows us to to make these simple function calls and access the program and access the programmable logic. Now, here's a in the best Blue Peter tradition. Uh, here's a diagram I saw earlier. Can you see the, Can you see this diagram on my whiteboard? All okay? Yeah. Perfect. It's perched right on the edge of right on the edge of my desk. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, it doesn't fall off because my dog's lying by my feet. So if you hear a sudden yelp, it's, uh, it's a whiteboard landing on the dog's head. 
Uh, but okay, so in this top box here, uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that. So in the top box here, we've got this is the zinc. This is the zinc processing element, which is which is obviously the the FPG and it's combined in two parts. In it. And within the pink Z2 board that we that I've used for this example, we have two A9. We have two A9 processor cores. So those those A9 processor cores, they're running. They're running Linux, so, so they're running Ubuntu and Ubuntu Linux distribution on there, and they have the pink, uh, they have the pink libraries and pink packages uh, added added in there. Now, one of the great things about oh, something like pink, you can actually download, uh, gives you the ability to work with the programmable logic, and how it does that, it has this concept of what it calls overlays. Now, these overlays are essentially programmable logic bit files. That are loaded into the pro in, that are loaded into the programmable logic part of the uh, of the FPGA, which is in this which is in the bottom half of this box. There's different boxes here. Mm -hmm. uh, by default, by default, the Xilinx uh, Xilinx Pink comes with a the pink image for the Z2 comes with a couple of images. One called the base overlay, which allows you to work with. If I pick this, if I hold this up again, hopefully you'll see it. And the base overlay allows you to work with the uh, the P mod uh, P mods that are connected here. With the shield overlay, with the uh, Raspberry Pi overlay that with the Raspberry Pi interface that we connected, and also you'll notice that there is a uh, you'll see there are HDMI in and out as well. So there are HDMI in and out. So this base overlay really is designed to allow us to work with those in work with those interfaces. So for instance, if we want to do image processing, we can grab an image from the HDMI in. We can do a little bit of image filtering, and then we can and we can push it out. To, H, to the HDMI, HDMI out, or we can do what we've done in this case, which is talk to the uh, to the voice using the uh, Raspberry, Raspberry Pi interface. How we do that, how it does that, is actually really quite interesting. So I'm just going to focus literally on the uh, on the sort of how it talks to the P mods and the Raspberry Pi and the and the shield because it's it's fairly it's fairly similar. Uh, so how it does that in the programmable logic loads it loads the first thing you do in your in your file is you load in this base overlay. Once you load this base overlay, you get a series of what are called uh, microblaze processors. So Xilinx has a soft core processor called a microblaze. It's a 32 bit processor. It's really powerful, and you can drop it in the drop it in the programmable logic. And what uh, and this is how it allows this is how the base overlay enables the the pink architecture, you know, the pipe the pipe that's running. To be able to communicate with real-time interfaces like that are needed to talk to the P mods or to talk to the uh, Raspberry, to the Raspberry Pi, and it does that by using it does that by having a, a block RAM, essentially a dual port, a dual port block RAM. Mm -hmm. So that enables the uh, that enables the A9s to be able to write into one one port of the block RAM and download the program into it, and the microblaze picks its program up from the from the same block RAM using the other port, mm -hmm. so as you can change the microblaze, you can change the microblaze on the on the fly. Uh, then we have a simple. Then there's a simple. So you see the block RAM, we can see the microblaze. Then we have a simple uh, I/O switch, actually, because we have, um, like all these things, we're a bit pin bound at times. So we can share either one of the P mods. We can talk, We can send the information to either one of the P mods for the Raspberry Pi interface. I can't remember which one of the P mods it is that shared, but it's. We can see the sending the Raspberry Pi interface over uh, over the PMOS. So we route, we route this through a, we route this through an I/O switch, and we can essentially we configure the output pins uh, as we want them uh, as well. So we, we we align the output pins with the Raspberry Pi connect. So we tell it we tell it where we'd like to put the SPI pins, for instance, uh, that we're going to use. Okay, I have a question. Um, I'm not yeah. sure if I like missed it while you were explaining, but the A9s are are they on? On the FPGA as well, like hardened so or yeah, so they're hard, so they're hard silicon. So they, so the the zincs are quite an interest. The zinc, the zinc MP stuff and such like they're quite an interesting device because they they essentially look like a pro they're a processor with FPGA added on because the processing system is the is the master. So if you've never developed any uh, FPGA applications before, you can you can literally pick them up and start developing using the ARM tool, using the ARM processor flow writing software code, and then sort of accelerating it. Uh, into the hardware. So yeah, so they're, they're hard, they're hard physical uh, devices in the silicon. Uh, once we, so how we talk to your, how we talk to your matrix voice is actually you, you use SPI to talk to your, to talk mm -hmm. to an F, to talk to a Spartan FPGA yeah. on your, um, 
you use SPI to talk to a Spartan 6 FPJ actually, another Xilinx FPJ mm -hmm. uh, that's on the that's on the matrix voice. Uh, and we just connect this we just connect this straight through to your uh, to your Spartan 6. Uh, so I just make sure that the SPI pins are mapped correctly through this IO switch. And then once I get once I'm talking to that Spartan 6 FPJ, what your what your what com, what's contained within your Spartan 6 FPJ, well, you know better than I do, but what's contained in there is it essentially is a memory map that allows me to access the microphone arrays that's on there, the LEDs, like I'm driving this LED round. Uh, there's a DAC on there as well, so I can access the DAC. Mm -hmm. And there's also some GPIO, so I can access the GPIO. So literally, when I send my when I send my, when I send my SPI commands across, I just have to send. I just have to know what address range that I want to send them, and the form and the format of the packet that I want to send, mm -hmm. and I can and I can send it all across. So that's kind of like how. Uh, how the flow all comes together, how we go from being able to write in the, and I should have drawn a box up the top here saying sort of Jupiter, mm. uh, Jupiter lab or something up here that allows us to, to create in our sort of, in our Jupiter, in our Jupiter notebooks. And then we can, then we can drive all the way down and get, get, get access to, to the matrix, the matrix voice. So is there any questions? Is there any questions so far? I mean, I should say I've written, I've written all this up on Hackster, so I'm sure we can mm -hmm. I'm sure we can share a link to my my Hackster project after this to anybody that wants to. Uh, yeah, actually, we put actually the Hackster in. project link in the live chat so people can look at it right now as well. Mm -hmm. um, but this is this is all explained in the Hackster, but having you draw it and explain it is actually really nice because mm -hmm. um, that way we can ask questions directly. I actually didn't realize that. There was a BRAM. I mean, I guess that makes sense. Um, when I was reading it, the BRAM is also in the pink board. Cause, yeah, because yeah. we have BRAM to write to the LEDs in the Spartan 6. Um, but I guess, is that just generally how you write, like, um, how you write to... Yeah, so uh, in effect, all I'm really doing is, all, all, all my all I'm really doing is writing a program that allows me to transfer across into the block RAM that's on your Spartan 6, such mm -hmm. that your uh, such that your Spartan six can then run its algorithms because you've got a sim you've got a similar you've got a similar approach to me you've got a similar approach to this you've got a dual port block RAM uh, with a an, an SPI slave on on one end so yeah. that you can receive the SPI commands from from me and then you've got a wishbone into you've got a wishbone interface going off to the individual controllers mm -hmm. and then those controllers actually take that information that's provided in the block RAM and actually just Execute their execute their al execute their algorithm. So I'm just literally like in this example here. It's just literally putting the uh, where we go. It's just literally writing a block RAM to the LED for the LED and saying right. turn this LED on, turn this LED on, turn this well, turn off this LED and uh -huh. then turn on the next LED in the, in the pattern. So, so it's really really quite simple. But right. So like if you can do LED. that, you can talk to anything in the you can talk to anything in the matrix voice and create whatever application you want. Right. Right. So I mean, theoretically, like this kind of a process should be like could be used to set up as long as like you know like um, like how the SPI communication is working. You can you should be able to set it up with any other board, theoretically, right? Like similarly to how you did this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can literally because SPIs SPIs are pretty much a de facto sort of in, I don't think it's actually an adopted industry standard. I think it's a de facto sort of industry standard. Uh, so yeah, you could you could connect this matrix voice to literally any any board. Uh, it doesn't have to be a it doesn't have to be a pink board. So if you've got if you've got anything that can push out SP, SPI and most embedded processors can, so you could perhaps do it with a little SPM32 or something like that, or a, uh, or, or a range of anything. Obviously, I know you guys have got quite a lot of support for the uh, for the Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. in there. And, and that was the first thing. I, the first thing I did actually was connect this board to the Raspberry Pi, and uh, and then and then prove it all worked, and then go, ah, okay, let's now let's now try and sort of go back and work out how it uh, how it works. Uh, but yeah, it, you could do it with any any sort of embedded any sort of embedded processor. Okay. Um, that SPI will do it. And then you programmed all of this in Python on the pink board. Ah, so that's a good. That, that's actually a really good question, and it almost looks like we've arranged that because <laughs> it, it segues nicely into this. But I, I, I swear we, I swear we haven't. So if I just switch over back to presenting my uh, screen, uh, 
let me just show you this again then. Uh, so if I share that. So hopefully you're now you should be able to now see my uh, now see the, the Jupyter notebook again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I'll explain a little and I can now I've explained the kind of the process the process flow that we're going through. I can I can walk you through my through my notebook and probably one of the first things you're gonna notice is actually we've got a little bit of a mix of C and Python in here, which I'll which I'll explain in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you zoom in a little bit to your screen? I can try. Uh, okay, perfect. So that way like that people on the stream will be able to see it a little better. Thank is that you. better? I'll not flick to my videos as I can see it, but hopefully that that's hopefully that's okay. okay. So the first thing, the first thing, if you're um, if you're not familiar with Jupyter notebooks, is it's really great. <laughs> They're really great because you can literally just sort of write your commands in here. So you can write your, you can create these cells. Uh, you can write your Python in there. Uh, you can hit the, you can hit run, and it'll run. And if it, and if it's successful, it'll it'll increment the little count here and tell you how many times you've run that box. If it doesn't run, it'll give you an error. It'll give you the errors below it, and you can just go back and change your code and hit run. So you can have this nice sequential sort of uh, development flow. So it's really, really quite cool. Uh, so let's let's start at the top. So in this, in this first box up here, actually, what I'm what I'm doing is I'm taking the pink. I'm from the pink overlays. I'm downloading this base overlay. So the overlay that I said contains the microblaze processors and the HDMI in and out functionality, along with a few other things. I'm actually I'm actually downloading that into the um, into the programmable logic of the of the design. And then here, I'm actually setting the uh, setting the switch, saying that I actually want to talk to the uh, talk to the Raspberry. I want to select the Raspberry Pi output and not the uh, not the PMO output. Oh, okay. There's a couple of things here. I'm just going to scroll down here one second, and then I, if I just click stop here, so that'll that'll stop my uh, that'll stop the LED from flying around. But there's a couple of functions here that are quite interesting. So if you if you if you're trying to do any interfacing with the Raspberry Pi, uh, sorry, any interfacing with the pink, uh, then you can. There's a number of clocks that run from the processor system to the programmable logic system in the in the zinc. And if I run this block here, what you'll see is it it goes away and it asks what the clock frequency of the, of the of clock zero is, and it comes back and it tells you well it's 100 meg. Uh, so that 100 meg is what's blocking the blocking the microblaze processor and everything on the on the board. Uh, but actually, and that's also going to put the SPI outputs and everything that's everything that's there. But actually, that might be a little bit too fast. We might have some signal integrity issues when we try and when we try and do that. So we might want to. So, so a really simple little little cheat because this is going to slow down the microblaze process as well, uh, which is why normally I didn't do it. But I, I'll explain it for uh, for it if you if you try it yourselves with, with different interfaces and you have issues. Is you can actually then change the clock frequencies by just setting the by just setting the clock frequency and then reading the clock frequency back, and you'll see it comes back. So it's now running everything at five megahertz as opposed to 100 megahertz. So you get a much slower, much nicer uh, sort of signal integrity going across that uh, Raspberry Pi connector if, if it becomes a uh, if it becomes an issue. But actually, that wasn't that wasn't a huge uh, a huge issue for for, the, for this design. Okay. What I want what I want to talk about now is once we've got that once we've got that microblue is actually instantiated. Uh, and the base base overlay essentially. What we want to do is we want to be able to write some we want to be able to write some applications to it and write uh, write the code that is running it. So in this in this cell here, I'm actually uh, telling the Jupyter compiler actually I want to I want to write code for the microblaze and this is the particular microblaze I want to write the code for. And then I've called a few C because this is C now. So I've called a few functions. I've called an SPI function, an I2C function, and and the switch function. Mm -hmm. And then I've literally. So we're not going to like in a traditional C program, you would write a main, uh, and then it would loop around. All I'm going to write in this are functions. So I'm going to write some C functions in here. Uh, I'm going to declare some SPI, GPIO, uh, and I2C devices. And then I'm literally just going to. I literally just created a few really simple GPIO functions just to. Just to drive the G, to connect the GPIO pins to the to the relevant pins, so I'm I'm selecting pin 26 on the on the header here, um, and then I'm open and I'm I'm opening it, so I'm I'm resetting it, I'm selecting the pin, uh, opening it, and then 
I'm assigning my reset signal to that to that pin. And then I can drive my I can drive the reset to my heart's content when I call this GPIO config function. I can do the same for the an accelerometer. Actually, this was when I first started writing this, I was uh, working with the matrix creator as well. So I created a, a, a read accelerometer function in I squared C and the corresponding setup I squared C function. And then for the voice, I actually created the, here you can see the setup uh, SPI function. So you can see it opens, there's two SPI devices. So it's opening SPI device one in this instance. So there's two SPI devices that are connected uh, potentially to the to the Raspberry Pi connector. So I'm opening uh, device one, and then I'm just telling it what pins I want to connect the SPI pins mm -hmm. to as well. So these are the S clock, and those are the uh, MISO and the slave select. Um, and then I'm just configuring, I'm just configuring that the SPI device as I as I've just previously defined it to be. And then re reading and writing is really simple. I just have a simple uh, little state, a simple little function that does that reads four bytes. Uh, obviously, when I read the four bytes, I need to do a little bit of little bit of logical shifting and alignment to uh, take a sixteen bit, take the sixteen bit word that I'm passing to it and splitting it into two bytes, mm -hmm. uh, sending across the uh, SPI interface. SPI is a very byte byte interface, byte oriented interface. Um, then I call the SPI. Then I call the SPI transfer function that's contained within uh, these libraries up above. And then the returned information. The returned information. I just uh, again. I just manipulate it into being a nice sixteen-bit number, not not two eight, not two bytes. And again, it's the same for the same for doing the write SPI. So I just create a simple write SPI command. So you put the you have the address, then you have the you have the address and the date. So in this one, you just have the address that you want to read. Uh, but in the right one, obviously, we've got the address. We've got the address coming in that we want to write to, and the data that come that comes in. And we have to make sure that we set the right bit as well, because there's a uh, you have to set bit 15 uh, as well. Can't remember which way you have to set it now. But one way you have to set it, yeah. So you have to set the least significant bit. So it's it's not really a 16 bit address. It's only a 15 bit address, and you set the least significant bit if you want to do a read. Otherwise, you leave it zero if you want to do a want to do a write. So you have to be very careful when you do the when you think about your address mapping and such like if you don't if you don't do this. And then it just transfers the data uh, and does the and does the return. So you can see we've got the uh, the SPI uh, setup here. So if I run the SPI setup, so when I run this SPI setup I, from Python, it's calling this this C function uh, running on the mic running on the microblaze, uh, which is really quite cool. And then all I've done really to drive the LED round is I've just defined a really simple uh, Python uh, function, uh, which I could control. So the LEDs, you have a, they're quite interesting. So they're 32-bit drives, and they've got a white, they've got a white, red, green, and blue uh, elements to them. Uh, this address here is actually the base, uh, the base address for where your LED resides in your in your Spartan 6 FPGA. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a little bit of manipulation just to pass the data. And again, you can see here I'm calling the SPI write command to write in the write in the date the, the low and the high data. So it's the 32 it's a 32 bit 32 bit word uh, per pixel. Each each element is each element white, red, green, and blue is eight is eight bits. So you can see I'm uh, I'm pushing that through there. Uh, and if you run that, and then we get down to this little function down the bottom, which if I run, uh, you'll see this goes to start. It just runs forever and it loops round. Uh, and if I Stop sharing again, and go back to the video. You'll see that the LED is now flicking, flicking around again. So that's a really quick sort of introduction to everything that uh, that I took, and a bit of a rambling explanation. So I'm really sorry if anybody wasn't able to able to follow 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 along because uh, it's trying to explain quite a complicated project in in, in 30 minutes is. Uh, as a little can can be a little challenge, but, but honestly, if anybody's got any questions, then uh, feel free to drop me feel, feel free to drop me an email or uh, or send me a uh, or send me a call. Let me just let my dog out of my office. Yeah. One second. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, that was going to be that was always going to be the case, wasn't it? So yeah, so sorry. Any any questions, and we can. Uh, 
Yeah, how long did it take for you to figure all of that out? <laughs> uh, about... Well, I started on a Friday and I finished about midday Saturday, something like that maybe, so probably about wow. 12 hours or so. Alright, so okay. everybody else will take like three days. Maybe more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I rewatched this live stream a couple times. <laughs> yeah, I was considering sitting here with my notebook, but then I was like, I'll just watch it later and I'll take notes. Um, but yeah, that's super cool. So theoretically, like, um, like for example, I have a Zybo Z7, I think, um, sitting at my house. Like if I wanted to get the this kind of a project working with that um uh, this is also pink is also zinc right is it the same i don't know if it's the same zinc chip but... so the, two are, the two are slightly different actually so pink you can put pink you can put pink on any um any zinc device okay. or zinc and psco2 device but there's not a so there are, there are some number there are a number of pink tissue images that you can get so the pink boards obviously have a pink image the Ultra 96, so the pink image you can download, um, uh, and there's a few there's a few boards. If you go to pink.io, you can find the boards with stored. I don't think there is a pink image for the Zybo, and I say that because one of my other hacks for projects is showing you how to create a pink image for the Zybo. Mm. Uh, is uh, but it's actually quite simple to do. It, it's really just a case of cloning cloning from GitHub. But but actually, if you really want to be adventurous, if you've got the Zybo, then you don't need to have you don't need to have pink running on there. You could you could just write it all in C or all in or use Petalinux Linux uh, right. to to act, to access it and access it in a slight it'd be a slightly different way, it'd be slightly slower because if you did just do it from Petal Linux it'd be slightly slower because you're not uploading the uh, the SPI communication to the microblaze, you're just doing it all from the uh, all from the A nines. But you could you could do it that way. So the million because it's just SPI, so there's a million and one ways you could uh, right. you could do it and get it up and running. Yeah, that's super cool. That's exciting. Uh, I haven't touched my Zybo yet, so this is a fun first project to try mm -hmm. out um, to you know get in there with the FPGA coding. Yeah. And question about the um, the Raspberry Pi header on the pink board is uh, other than powering ground. Are all the other pins on there reconfigurable? Like you could have a random other pin be I two C or uh, SPI. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's it's fairly quite it's fairly config it's a fairly configurable interface actually. Okay. I've I've not tried to I've not tried to stress it out and go and see how see where I hit the limits. Okay. But yeah, within the within the bounds of what you've got available on the uh, available in the pink interface, you know, the pink Mac and Blaze interface to to connect to it. It's it's really quite so you can connect. I think you can connect UART, I squared C, SPI to it, GPIO. Uh, and I think it might be maybe even a pulse width modulated signal, but I'd, but I'd have to check that. Right, and then to figure it all out, like to figure out how the communication worked and everything like that, you did the te you used the test bench um, timing diagrams uh, as a reference, right? Yes. Yeah. So. The, the, so I, because your your documentation is at a slightly higher level based around the sort of the, the Raspberry Pi, so I actually grabbed your test benches from um, from GitHub and then simulated them all in uh, Bravado. Uh, I know you did it in actually in ISC, but it's just it's just Verilog, so I actually right. it, was, it was easier for me to simulate it in Bravado. So I just simulated it in Bravado simulator just to actually see uh, when the test bench what your test bench was doing, so that I could work out what the uh, I do a little bit of reverse engineering and work out what your address ranges were for specific things, such as your LEDs and, and so on. Okay. Um, we have a question. Oh, okay. Well, it seems like you answered it. Um, uh, but somebody in the live chat, actually, he's one of our team members, uh, had asked if uh, you had to do any discovery to figure out how to use the matrix and if the sheets and docs provided were adequate to complete your ambitions. Um, but seems you addressed it. Yeah. I, I, I think your documentation is great for if you want to use it for, if you want to use it for Raspberry Pi. I think yeah. if, you, if you want to do a little bit, if you want to do a little bit more, if you want somebody to interface it with, a, with an STM32 or something, then you could just, if you just popped up the address maps or things like that, I think it would be a little bit, uh, a little bit more clear. It was all the information there. I just had to dig a little bit. Right. Okay. 
We'll, uh, we'll bring it a little more to the surface then. <laughs> yeah, um, I think because what you're doing is pretty unique in terms of projects we've seen and mm-hmm. projects like we generally do. Because everything we do is generally on the Raspberry Pi, right? But like um, when you're doing something with another board, you need to know more of the hardware level. Okay, what are the addresses? What is the endianness? Um, what is the memory map like? All that, all those things you went over in the Hexter guide. Um, but also, like what you did is like you basically are writing the libraries ground up, right? Like you're using SPI directly. Like we have like abstracted libraries for that in the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. You do, yeah. So you you have um, you have a lot of you have a lot of libraries in there that'll that'll do that directly, um, and. And this 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 does now, but I but I but I had to work out what the you know what the what the what the address range is, what bits mean what, where what's an address, what's a well, even simple things like what's a read and what's a you know how do I read and write to it because you need that you need to have a bit somewhere in the interface that says I want to read this address or I want to write this address and and, and all those and all those things. But yeah, it was to be honest, it was relatively straight. Once you work it out and with and the simulations provide you everything, you really you really need you can you can work for it quite easy another question somebody just reminded um on the live chat that we have an esp32 do you have the esp32 matrix voice by any chance no i don't oh okay because that would be curious because uh we use uart to talk to the esp32 to the raspberry pi so it would be interesting to see if you could uh like how it would be to control the esp32 through the pink uh interface I don't think I, I I don't think that would be an issue at all actually, uh, because the the because you're using just the UART, aren't you? So you said oh it's two three two, so it's just a it's just a UART. It's, you're not going to be using uh, UART level voltages. You're just going to be using sort of TTL voltages. So uh, we could you could pick the same you could pick the same you could take the same approach mm-hmm. that I did as well as connecting the SPI. You could also connect the uh, you could connect the UART to the microcontroller and then write the same write the same code in there. Nice. Yeah, this is super cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, I'm not sure if we have more questions. Um, in the meantime, um, could you explain to us some basics of, <laughs> of this like hardware um, level? Like, okay, so roughly know what JTAG is, but could you explain how you use JTAG to program the matrix voice Without the Raspberry Pi. Yes. So, <laughs> so maybe I, where to start for, for, for people? So, okay. So, so JTAG it's a it's a test interface port. Stands for Joint Test Action Group, uh, and essentially it uses four four signals. So it's a serial it's a serial protocol essentially, and it has four signals: a clock, a data in, a data out, and a test mode and a test mode signal. Uh, now, pretty much most most sort of FPGAs, processors, and such like have uh, have JTAG interfaces for, for enabling you to connect to them and do debug. So I'm sure the Pi's got one somewhere for people doing debug on the on the Pi if they want if they want to or bring up the Pi anyway. Uh, but pretty much every FPGA has got one, and it's how it's how you program the FPGA. So you have two options within when you program the FPGA, you can actually just program the because the FPGAs are SRAM based. You can use the JTAG controller within the FPJ to actually program the, the, the device itself. Mm. Uh, so you can put the implementation in the FPJ itself, and that will run just as it just as uh, as normal. The downside to that, obviously, is the minute you cycle the power, uh, because it's an SRAM based FPJ, you'll lose the you lose the configuration data. Right. Uh, the better way, the better the, the way that you work with around FPJ, SRAM based FPJs with that is that you have a um, non-volatile memory and SPI flash or something connected to the to the FPJ, and um, because because the JTAG actually has the ability to uh, not only program the uh, internals of the FPJ, but it can also uh, toggle the uh, outputs of the FPJ as well. So it can toggle, it can drive the outputs of the FPJ. You can actually drive the, you can actually program the SPI device using the using the JTAG programmer. Through the through the FPGA, so you can program the you can program the chip, the non volatile memory, and then when you turn it off and turn it on again, the FPGA will load its configuration from non volatile memory, 
provided the FPJ has got the right configuration pins to go away and pick up from the non-volatile memory, it's, right. there's a little bit, to, it's a, it, that's a really quick sort of 30 second answer because it's quite a, uh, yeah. it's quite a long and complicated, it's quite a long and complicated process uh, and it's one of the, it's not long and complicated, but it's one of the areas that I've seen people when they design their own custom boards have some issues with when it doesn't boot in the way that it doesn't boot or it, it has some issues. Got you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we had some issues on that with some early prototypes. <laughs> Recall some team members uh, pulling out their hair <laughs> and like putting yeah. little wires to like jump things to get it to work. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's quite common, I think. So you have to just dis you have to just work you have you have to just work through it. But it's uh, but it's really actually JTAG, aside from programming FPJ, JTAG is a really powerful uh, sort of interface standard. Yeah, definitely need to learn more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked, I'm not sure what OpenCL, CI maybe, CL, I'm not sure, can't tell. CL, uh, any yeah. experience with OpenCL and FPGA? Uh, yeah, so I've actually got quite a bit of experience with like sort of OpenCL and FPGAs. Uh, so you can use, so OpenCL slightly different to the pink, uh, the pink flow that we've been talking about today. So that allows you to have sort of a, a host application running in a, in a kernel and an accelerated kernel application and that accelerated kernel could be on anything it could be on an FPJ it could be on a it could be on an ASIC it could be on a specific uh, it could be on a GPU even and they have standard sort of interfaces and calls in this OpenCL framework to actually allow you to, to do that so the new actually the new uh, Vitus tool from Xilinx is all based around using uh, open OpenCL uh, for, for accelerating uh, the Zinc and the Zinc MP SOC uh, FP, FPGAs, and it's it's kind of kind of like a, 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 a the next generation of their SDSOC and their SDXL tools, which use C and, and, and OpenCL, okay. and it's free. I should say it's free to download. All right, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, so many tools to look into. <laughs> um, all right, well. Not sure if we're going to have any more questions, but regardless, uh, you can ask more questions in the YouTube comments, um, and also even in comments on uh, the Hackster Guide Adam wrote. Um, and yeah, I, that's, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. Us, that um, was great. You have anything else, Adam? <laughs> any no, exciting no, no, new I'm, projects? I'm, I'm going to go and uh, going to go and uh, take a look at this, and we'll yeah, maybe, maybe I'll do a few more. Maybe I'll see if I can do another Hackster project that. Uh, Maybe I'll get an ESP32 on it and see if I can actually uh, get the UART to talk on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would cool. be fun. And then I saw in your Hackster guide you said an expansion area might be like doing something with the mics um, to trip the LED direction or something like that. Yeah, I was thinking about changing. I was thinking about uh, sort of being able to click your fingers and the LED change direction depending on where you click your fingers. Mm. But, but I've not got around to it, it, time is one of the things oh, that yeah, I, for sure. I never, I never <laughs> time is the most precious thing in the world and I never I never seem to have any to kind of go back and do these things but uh, but it's on it's on my list of uh, of go back to and do at one point in time. Yeah. Well thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. It's always a pleasure to like hear you speak because I mean a lot of what you say goes over our heads, I think. Yeah, mine especially. <laughs> but <laughs> But what's good is like now we know what we can look up and learn. Um and your hackster guide is super helpful um to like, you know, help like direct people who are like just getting started. <laughs> Sean uh, on the chat said I feel educated, thanks. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for thank you very much for having me. Apologies for my dog barking midway through. You know, it was obviously time to go and get some food or something. <laughs> but yeah, uh, no uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And if anybody's got any questions, just feel free to reach out. Okay. Awesome. Great. Sounds thank you, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right. So. Bye. Bye. Cool. All right, so going here. Back. All right, cool. Wow, yeah, that was. Oh my god, exciting. so much stuff. Honestly, it's not that much code. No, it's like, not. Figuring it out from scratch is difficult, but well, it's, since he's already made it, it's a lot easier. Now, I don't know what else you could do with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's that would be hard then. Um, but it's, it's 
Good, a lot, a lot of things to look up. <laughs> yeah, I know, for sure. Um, the JTAG thing is super interesting because mm -hmm. I've heard it thrown around, I've heard the term thrown around so much, um, but need to learn more about it because that's how m more than the, like there are other components other than our FPGA that are also programmed via JTAG, um, also on the Matrix Creator. So it's just an interesting thing to know because I feel like it makes it easier to program with other boards if somebody mm -hmm. wanted to go out and... Um, make a guide or you know yeah yeah I mean on any orange pie tinker board like yeah. there's a lot of people have requested other boards exactly. um, the only limitation that I'd see is more like interfacing with sound specific things like um, uh, what's the one on the pie that we use um, I forgot um, Elsa? yeah Elsa yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> um, yeah Elsa I was thinking asound.com instead of Elsa. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's Elsa, but okay. Um, so announcements? Yeah, so our SNPs contest ended uh, Sunday, uh, mm -hmm. and we have 24 submissions. Super excited. Oh, yeah. Um, we are in the process of judging. Yes, and the up late last night judging. <laughs> <laughs> and the winners will be announced shortly uh, by the end of... I think, I think Monday, I yeah. Think. Uh, Monday yeah. of next week, we'll announce the winners. And um, so, yeah, that's super exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a Project 14 webinar a couple weeks ago. Go check it out. Mm -hmm. um, it was like NFC, Google Assistant to make it privacy focused. Mm -hmm. And then also we showed off our Halloween project. Yes, which is back there. I don't know if they can see it. Yeah, they, they can. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, those are the ma major announcements. Okay. Oh, and in two oh, weeks, yes. we will be Definitely. in California, in Mountain View, um, at the ARM AIoT Dev Summit. So that's December 2nd and 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to be doing a workshop on the 2nd, the first day of the conference, our workshop. 1 to 2.30 p.m. Nice. <laughs> um, and we're going to be basically showing how to use like a matrix creator, a Raspberry Pi, to create like voice controlled robotics. Um, so come check it out. Sign up for the workshop. Uh, if you go through our Twitter, uh, there we have a discount code that you can use to get. Uh, I don't know how much the discount $75. was. $75. Okay, pretty good. Um, so yeah, check it out. Yeah, we'll put the information for, like, the, we'll put the link of this Hackster guide that Adam talked about, the the events we have coming up, and the discount code and everything in the description of the video. So mm -hmm. you should have access to that. Awesome. Right. So well, thank, thank you for joining. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs>